you could be combative right back. And I've done it. Like I only think <laughs> I've, done it. I've been that person who likes, well, I actually like, I'm going to challenge you on that. Literally use those words. Like, like it's a battle. It's not like, this isn't, I'm going to win or you're going to win. We're trying to collaborate together on a solution to this problem that you clearly have because you came to us. Conversations are at the heart of everything we do, but how do you turn a conversation into revenue? Welcome to B2B EQ, a podcast from Unifor. I'm your host, Tim Harris. Join me as I interview business leaders and market makers to learn how to move deals forward, scale best practices, and establish relationships that create value and grow revenue. Let's get started. All right, welcome back to B2B EQ. Today's guest is a sales superstar, a Salesforce top influencer in 2023. She made the pivot from head of marketing to a high level sales role to help revenue leaders reach their aggressive growth goals. She is a senior account executive at Chili Piper, Ashley Zags. Ashley, great to have you on. Thanks for having me. Yeah, so tell me a little bit before we jump in. I want to get into, okay, how you made this jump from marketing to sales, right? Those two sides of the house are typically a big leap on different different sides, but but make some of the best sellers and some of the best marketers, especially in the space with uh, with Chili Piper. So tell me a little bit before we jump in on this journey. I am curious to, to dig in and hear your backstory. Yeah. Um, so I love the story. I um, started off in marketing because before, like we even go a little bit further back before I got into tech, I was a professional dancer. So um, I made the the leap into tech. And, and when I did that, I had, you know, I had friends who were working at different tech companies in San Francisco. And I talked to anybody who would listen to me and the general consensus was like, oh, you're the quirky artsy kid. You're going to be just fine in marketing. Like, you know, that's where you should go. And it made sense to me. And it it really did make sense um, at the time. And it was great. Mm-hmm. I started off um, as a marketing intern at an ad tech company in the Bay Area. And that was just, whoa. Um, like that's a whole other podcast uh, that we can yeah. record. I'm um, that down. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, fast forward a couple of companies later, I get hit up by um, somebody I worked with at that first ad tech company who was about to start this interesting little project called Bravado. And okay. it was in stealth mode at the time. I was employee number four. You know, it was not even a website, right? Like we were, he was like, you know, we're going to need marketing. So you want to help? And I was like, yeah, let's do this. Yeah. Um, turns out I spent the next three years helping build that brand, build that community for salespeople. So my job every single day was, you know, talking to salespeople, creating content for salespeople, trying to understand who they were, what makes them tick, how to destigmatize the role, why it's stigmatized in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely was like an opportunity for me to, uh, to address some of the stereotypes that I held about the role. Um, I was meeting some of the most amazing people. Um Got the opportunity to go to Serpent Sales my first time while I was at Bravado. Met Scott Lease and Richard Harris in person. I had already been connected with them. Seeds were planted, right? Like wheels were turning. Uh huh. Um, I started to think about this as like a really awesome challenge and a creative opportunity for myself. And I'm always looking to like grow and improve and try new things. And this was just super intriguing. That was like one of the like the first kind of sparks that led me to to even entertain the idea of exploring maybe moving over to sales Mm -hmm. the other pieces were around i talked a lot about championing diversity in sales like that was one of our pillars at bravado talked a lot about it spoke at events about it created content about it like just a lot of talk right Mm -hmm. i got tired of talking about it and i wanted to actually do something about it. Be uh-huh. about it. Uh-huh. Um, because as much as I was talking to salespeople all day, every day, I didn't see a lot of people like myself and the statistics are out there. Like it's, you know, a decently even split in the entry level roles, maybe SDRs, you know, whatever. But as you start to climb up, you see fewer and fewer and fewer women and you see fewer 
women of color and you see fewer queer women. Yeah. So like, these were things that I was like, oh no, like I'm not going to write another blog post or speak at an event about this. I'm going to actually go be that representation that I don't see. And then lastly, I'm a high performing human. Yeah. I, like anybody who meets me knows that like, if I put my mind to something, I'm going to do it and I'm going to do it really well. So it's like nails on a chalkboard to me when I go to work and I give my all to my uh -huh. job and I get my paycheck <laughs> and then, you know, someone else is going to come in and do the bare minimum yeah, and get the say, you know, and get their paycheck. So to know that there was a role that existed that basically the more you put in, the more you get out. That was hugely attractive to me. In addition to these other things that were, I was really passionate about, or that were just really intriguing about moving into sales. So very long winded answer to your question. Oh, there's a lot of depth and self-reflection there. Like a lot of self-awareness about yourself that just came out of that. Yeah. Yeah. So there you have it. That's awesome. And, and you learned the space, you learned what it was like to be a seller. And now at Chili Piper, you sell to go to market and, and sales leaders and revenue teams all day. So you speak the language. Exactly. That's awesome. Well, yeah. I'm excited to dig in more about your work at Chili Piper. But before we do that, one question I ask all my guests, usually when we kick it off at, but I wanted that context. I think that's important is in B2B sales today, what is the one soft skill? that you think is creating the biggest impact in revenue, but also in relationships? Hmm. I'm sure you've heard this before, but I have to go with empathy. Okay. Tell Being, me a little bit more on why, like what's your theory on that and what you, where you're coming from? Yeah. So <laughs> I think I, th I heard this, you know, when I first started, sales, which, you know, 2020, when I first started my sales career, I heard, you know, the, the conversation around human to human selling, right. Or even before I got into sales at Bravado, we talked a lot about people buy from people, not from some company logo for the most part, you know, really talented sellers, they get this and, you know, folks will go in and they understand that they need to be empathetic to their buyer. They need to actively listen, right? Like they've read all the books. They, they know what you need to do to have a, a successful sales cycle. There, there's been this, and I've said this, this understanding or this thought that like our biggest hurdle, the biggest objection we can face is the status quo, uh -huh. which like, that's not wrong. It's, it's, you know, in some scenarios, that is what you're going to face. Somebody's going to be like, you know what? We're just really good with what we've got. And that's fine. But what we, what I'm noticing, and I think what a lot of people are noticing, especially in the past, I don't know, six to nine months mm -hmm. has been that, so we see the inaction, we see people not wanting to make the decision and we'll chalk it up to like, oh, well, they're just fine with the way things are status quo. Oh, well, we'll get them next time. Yep. I know those conversations. Well, I've heard those often. Yep. That's only a part of the picture. I think what we're missing or what we're failing to miss uh, see is there's a fear. Yeah. Um, there's a fear of messing up. So uh, I'm reading this book called The Jolt Effect, and they talk all about this. And it's interesting because like this was something I was already noticing in my conversations. And then I read this book and I was like, ha ha, like, yeah. I'm on this. Yes, I, it's resonating. Um, but essentially, you know, it's not that they think what they have is better. It's that they're afraid of if they make this decision and it doesn't work out, like it's no longer a situation where like, oh, well, it didn't work out. Like we're going to have to go find something else. The situation now is, oh, it didn't work out. I lose my job or my team has to be eliminated because companies are teetering on that edge of like, are we growing? Maybe. Are we imploding? Uh, you know, yeah. we've had to do layoffs. 
We haven't hit certain revenue targets. We have to lay more people off. So you ask them to buy a twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollar solution, and there's no like connection there. It's not going to happen. Like <laughs> they're not going to do it. And I think people, the understanding of empathy is, um, is pretty surface level in some scenarios. And so this is where, like personally for myself, I'm trying to figure out like how to get deeper and understand that more on a deeper level. Um, We started doing this project here at Chili Piper called the Empathy Project, actually. Yeah. Tell me more about this. This is interesting. You mentioned it a little bit when we first talked and and this really sparked my interest because that part on buyer confidence has come up in a lot of conversations I talk to people on. And I think you're at the core of something that's that's really, really prominent in the world. And I don't think that the stuff as marketers that we throw at prospects in terms of a case study or a testimonial or an ROI report or a, a, an ROI calculator is really solving for that. So I'm curious what, what you're doing at Chili Piper. Yeah. So this was like a, a trial run experiment that we did Um And, you know, I'd love to say that like, and it made me like my win rate doubled because of this thing. I can't, it's not a causation by any means, Mm -hmm. but there's definitely correlation to uh, some improved, some improved statistics, but essentially, you know, we worked with some of our talent development coaches just to better like define empathy and understand what it is in the context of a sales conversation and then role play and experiment with like, how to find that in these conversations. Um, Because again, you know, active listening, sure, I can listen and like ask probing questions, go deeper in the pain funnel, help you realize the pain. I think it's all about intention though. Like if all of that is just so that you can get to the end of the sales cycle and be like, well, here, sign the dotted line because we're going to solve these problems that you said you had that, you know, whatever. That is it that, you know, you're getting on the same side of the table kind of with your prospect but we have to go deeper empathy is sometimes not pro- like it's not always about like providing the solution it's just making making the connection or, or i guess empathy is understanding that you don't you cannot provide the solution until you make the connection first and i think we skip over that we think we make a connection because we think we're engaging and, you know, listening and whatever, we're following the rules from all these books we've read and all these trainings we've had, but are you really like, is this how you would talk to a friend or a family member or a peer? Like is, if somebody came to you and said they have a serious problem, like, is this how you would talk to them? Um, so yeah, we've been experimenting with this and it's, it's a work in progress. I'm always a work in progress, but I think, yeah, diving deeper into what that looks like in these sales conversations is hugely important. I can give sort of a, a an example. You know, I think I had a I had a buyer who we were in a very long deal cycle. We'd actually already been through one close loss, came back, restarted the conversation. Um, their problem was pretty common, uh, mm-hmm. common one that Chili Piper solves. And, you know, we have competitors in the space, like everyone, and there are, there are certain things that like the, this particular competitor, there's like two features in particular that they have that we don't, and they came up. Uh-huh. And I was like, yeah, we don't do that. You know, I don't know. Instead of getting caught up in like the feature differences, you're trying to, yeah. I leaned more into, I was trying to like get closer to them and what their problem was and why that was a problem to begin with. And like at the end of the day, we figured out that like, well, with Chili Piper, that actually won't be a problem anymore. So you won't even need that feature to solve that part of the problem because this is, this other thing's going to be addressed. Right. So that, you know, there's that. In fact, I, you know, they told me the the prospect told me like, we're going with you because of the relationship we built here and because of the experience we've had in this very long sales cycle, you know, um, I now look at this person as like, you know, like I have their cell phone number. We're texting like, and people yeah. all the time. They're like, you kind of like quasi make friends with your prospects. And I think that's a really great step. 
it's deeper than just sort of the surface level stuff that we're taught, which I think is great. It's a great starting point, but you have to like figure out how to put that into context and create relationships and make the connection first because you can't solve the problem until you have made that connection. I I think you're spot on. I think I'll I'll build off of what you said with people buy from people because I know that's something we agree with here at Unifor. It's it's people buy from people that they like and trust. And I think what you're what you're hitting on is that feeling that, you know, not only did you hear me when I said you know, I'm looking at these other features that, that another solution has, but you didn't go and defend it and give me the objection handling and the, and the vice versa. You said, you're right. I see it. You see it. We call it, just be honest. This is the trust part, right? It is what it is. I don't have those features, but then let's go back to the objective and the solution. Because I think a lot of the time when we talk about competitors, it's almost a red hair, right? It's like this, this feature is great but are you buying that feature or are you trying to solve the problem that's right here? And, and it's refocusing that buyer back as well, because I think just like anything, we go shopping for something. I just, you just bought a house. I just remodeled a house. Oh, well, do do you want this sink with the, you know, you put your hand under it and the water turns off. Cool feature. But now let's look through what you actually do all day. Or if you have kids or whatever else, do you really want the water turning on every time a little hand goes underneath there? You're like, you have to bring it to life for the individual. And I think that's where the empathy piece that you're talking about comes in because you're really listening and understanding and putting yourself in that buyer to solve that problem rather yeah. than just throwing features. Absolutely. And it's kind of this idea of like, instead of when something like that comes up, instead of coming at it head on and, and trying to like objection handle, you know, mm-hmm. Uh, instead of being toe to toe or head to head with the prospect, can we just sit next to each other and like get team up and figure, yeah. it, out, figure it out together? Because uh, as soon as you start to like objection handle in, in that scenario, you're st- that you're putting them on the defensive, and like that's the again. Would you talk to your friends like that when they brought up a situation? Like I mean, maybe, but most likely not yeah no you're you're spot on a a, the analogy to me somewhat is like a um like a doctor and a patient like a really good doctor patient relationship right not a bad one but a good one where they listen they check they test they don't just go right in with well here's your prescription and and ice it two times and and be done that's important i think it's critical in as deals get more and more complex and it's like you said the markets become more crowded and there's more of the exact same and duplicates and, and overlaps between different solutions. That consultative approach seems to be what wins out. And it starts with people to people. Sure. Yeah. I, I like the way you're, you're looking at this. And, and so how, as you go through this empathy project, how are some of the ways that you're looking at empathy. You said you define empathy. Like what's, what, what is your definition for Chili Piper? Like how do you define it in that sales environment? Because I think a lot of people have a hard time. They say empathy and they go straight to like the woo woo touchy feely. They don't go to, this is what empathy is in a commercial relationship. We have an initiative here at Chili Piper uh, around nonviolent communication, Mm -hmm. um, both internally and externally. Like just, this is just, part of our values Um, and so this project was sort of an extension of that and so the I think we're the definition of this is kind of malleable in this like trying to figure because we are still trying to experiment and figure out how this fits in but empathy is the universal human need for being deeply understood Um, we can think of it as like respectful or compassionate understanding and we're basically embodying and being completely present with this other person. So we're in the moment with them right then and there. And again, sometimes it's not even about presenting a solution to said problem. It's just being there with them in that problem or in that moment of whatever they're feeling. And that's it. Like it's yeah. so simple, but also like really hard to to do sometimes. Yeah. Very profound. And I think you summed it up really well when you said 
It's not about me being across the table from somebody. It's about me sitting at the table with somebody. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's, that's a big change just in how you see that. Cause now it's like two people, two friends enjoying a conversation rather than like the debate back and forth. Yeah. Which, which the tug of war seems to never, never work. So how are some ways that you've created buyer trust? You, you know, you've done an amazing job building a voice and, and thought leadership in this market. And so with that, I'm sure you've made a lot of personal and professional connections. How do you break those down? How do you look at, at you know, building trust and, and what are some of the things you do to build that, that buyer confidence? I, yeah, I mean, again, this feels like super simple, but I guess I'm, I am always like, I've always said that I just want to be authentically me in every scenario. Um, I, I, this is a silly example or a silly story, but I dated this person who, when they would answer the phone, like if it was a work call, like their voice was so incredibly different or how they spoke was so incredibly different than when they weren't on the phone. Not a big deal. Like, do you, you're, professionalism whatever <laughs> i've never been that person like i am who i am yeah whether i'm talking to and and i guess the other thing is like i know there's a lot of conversation especially with newer sellers like the nervousness around speaking to like an executive a C- yeah business buyer c-suite and you're 20 something years old 30 something years old never been there yeah they put their legs, their pants on one leg at a time or whatever that phrase. I love the saying. Yes. You're spot on. Yep. Like I'm not, I don't necessarily care who, who they are, what their title is. I'm going to care. Right. But like yeah. not in so much, in so far as like, it's going to make me speak to them differently or act differently. Like, so again, it's just bringing my authentic self to the conversation. Um, being respectful and and being present, I think is, is another one like that. The quickest way to lose trust is to like, especially now when we're on these zoom calls and we can see each other is if you, you know, and people have done this to me, unfortunately, like, you know, prospects or buyers or whatever is this thing. (laughs) I love how you held it up. Yep. Right. Like if, if I'm talking to you on zoom and I see you, right. Like, I'm seriously just don't do it. Or, you know, uh, if, if it's very clear that you aren't present and engaged, you're kind of disconnected. And I think one thing that's, um, that came up in our, the empathy project myself and and another rep were talking about this is like, sometimes you get to the end of the day and maybe you've had four or five calls. Maybe some of them have gone well, maybe some of them haven't remembering to go into each conversation as a like blank slate. They don't know you. They don't know what has happened in your day. You don't know what has happened in their day. Yeah. And it's like that going in with a fresh and open blank slate mind and being present in that conversation, because as soon as you check out, like it's obvious. And that's like a really quick way to lose trust or at least like make it a lot harder for yourself to build it, you know? Because it is, it is, it's hard to build, easy to lose. I, I love your call out of the iPhone prayer. That's what we call it. It's like, you know, everybody looks like they're down praying like this. And you're like, okay, I can see the tops of your heads. Nobody's paying attention. So two follow-up questions. One, how do you get a read on like sentiment and engagement when you're selling? I was actually just coaching an SDR on this earlier today because they're going to be applying for an AE role here. And one of the things, especially when there's multiple people on the call. Yeah. Speaking to them, Uh say their name, engaging with them in the conversation. And so that the opposite is true. Like if you have been having this active and engaging conversation with uh, these people and there's somebody who's just kind of checked out, even if you're trying to engage, you know, whatever it is, um, you know, you, you can get a sense there's a wall up or maybe they are engaging with you, but they're super combative. Yeah. Like, that sentiment's just negative. Yeah. Like you can tell like, 
They're just coming at you. And that's a perfect, perfect, no better place to insert some empathy there because they're clearly coming from something. Yeah. You aren't seeing. And so you could be combative right back. And I've done it. Like I only think <laughs> I've done it. I've been that person like, well, I actually like, I'm going to challenge you on that. Literally use those words. Like, like it's a battle. It's not like, this isn't, I'm going to win or you're going to win. We're trying to collaborate together on a solution to this problem that you clearly have because you came to us. Um, yeah. But for some reason you get in this mindset of like, it has to be this battle. And we use a lot of language around that, you know, in sales. And so I think that like, you can get a read on it just by people's body language, their tone, whether they're engaging with you, but you know, maybe they are, but again, it's like in a certain way that is super either off-putting or combative. And then you kind of just have to lean in. I don't have children, but I have a lot of nieces and nephews. And yeah. when they're pretty bratty, it's because something else is going on. Some one, a need hasn't been met. <laughs> yeah. As shitty as it is for them to be bratty to you. It's like, <laughs> you know, me being bratty back isn't going to help. <laughs> so I, you know, have to be the calm one or be the show a little empathy and kindness and like try to figure out where that's coming from and how we can work together to figure it out. You know, it's, it's a good approach. It's not like I need to change them. It's no. that I need to be the calm one and figure out how I can impact that change that and kind of influence that sentiment or engagement and work through it. I, I like, I like the approach you take before meetings. I feel like you've got some magic here. I don't know if it's, it's meditation in the morning or if there's, you know, some of those different things, because I think that, that all those you can say woo woo, but I think it's important, you know, the mental state of the seller, they, there's a Gartner, it scared me. There's a Gartner stat that came out that said 95% of sellers are burnt out. Yeah. And it scares me because if you're bringing that burnt out frustration into every customer call, every prospect call, into internal meetings, that tension has to go somewhere and it usually doesn't end up in the right spot, right? Like it usually doesn't make for good things to happen. So how do you stay calm and cool and collected? What are what are some very tactical things maybe that you do before meeting to, to kind of come on to the camera ready to go and in a, in a good headspace. I wish I could say I meditated every day, but I don't. <laughs> Let's see. Tactically before a call, I think one of the best things that I can do for myself is be prepared for the call. Yeah. Know who I'm talking to have reached out to them already via email or LinkedIn, whether they respond or not, but I've already kind of put myself out there. This, you know, I know about their organization. I have a an idea of like why they might be, you know, on this call with me, whether it's, you know, they came inbound or I outbounded to them or an SDR booked it, whatever it is, I need to do well, at least some research so that I go into this call prepared and already that's going to, it's going to help. It's going to make that initial start of the conversation a lot easier. Um, if we kind of step outside of that uh, you know, take a step back a little further. Um, you know, you bring up burnout and it's real. It is yeah. so real. Um, especially given the current state of things. And and I say current state, and that's really feels like it's in the past like three or four years of the state of things. Yeah. And so I it is a priority for me to take care of me. And that means if I need to take a break and go outside and walk my dog and get some fresh air, I do that. It means I know that going and taking a dance class, like, is like ibuprofen for me. Like it's, it's, yeah, me, it's you know, the thing you need, the thing I need. Or if I don't, you know, if I don't have time to go out for a walk with my dog, or if I don't like, you know, I haven't been to class in a week, but I need I play these things. Like I just sit down, <laughs> bash the shit out of these drums, get out some energy, whatever it is. Like you, you have to find outlets that both allow you to get out that tension that you might be feeling. And also that fill you back up. And then I think the other piece to this puzzle, which will some organizations 
struggle in this area more than others. It's having a psychologically safe space, being able to go to your manager and say, I'm struggling, (laughs) I need help, or I need a break, and what that looks like and how you're supported in that. Um, Yeah, I don't know. No, good insights. And and something that I think all of us, especially as you get into the concept of like every 30 minutes, you're on another Zoom call. I, I can't say that enough because I think a lot of people live in that reality and you don't get the water cooler time. You don't get sometimes those other stops because it's just, oh, if I don't block out time on my own calendar, it doesn't happen. Or it's the end of the month. It's quota. It's this, it's that. It's I've got to hit these numbers. But those last minute things typically are just going to burn you out and impact you, but it won't impact the outcomes. Right. Yeah. No, good, good insights there. So, you know, I think we've, we've walked around it quite a bit, but in terms of, you know, how you approach selling, it's a high EQ sale and it's really focused on, on the person. And, um, you know, some of the things you've talked to about self-awareness and, and reading the room and, and really getting a read on people, it comes back to like what you said, we, we humans still buy from humans until that changes. This is going to be kind of the foundational pieces of, of how we go to market. Yeah, a hundred percent. So, so what excites you for the future? What are some things that you're working on at Chili Piper that are maybe going to change the future of sales for the better? Um, Tell me a little bit about what 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 you've got going on and and what the future has in store. I'm just excited about seeing this shift of focus. Like I internally actually it's been great to like see other reps kind of come to that realization of like, hey, look, we have more competitors in space now. You know how we're gonna win deals? Rep to rep, like not feature to feature. And so if we're the better rep, if we're the better relationship, like, you know, we're going to win more deals. And I think seeing that is is pretty exciting. And then seeing the effort being put in by leadership here to provide people with the resources and the training and the practice. I think that's the other thing that is super helpful that it doesn't happen a lot or or I don't know if it does, whatever, like, I think it gets overlooked. I think to your point, uh, I keep going on that. Cause I think it does. It doesn't get overlooked sometimes. Kevin Dorsey said this a while back. He was like, you know, uh, as adults, especially adults, you like, maybe you played sports as a kid or maybe you danced when you were younger, whatever, like yeah. you'll spend hours of your evenings or weekends playing pickup ball or going to dance class or riding your bike or going for runs. You'll spend hours on that to get better at it. Right. And yet, when it comes to like the sales skills, we spend hours doing it in our day to day work, but this is like live on this a is the game the time. time. Yeah. Exactly. It's yeah. performance. We yeah. don't. And I actually brought this up. I was like, it's amazing to me coming from a professional dance background, like, Yes, there's improvisation and I love that. I love that kind of dance. I love that kind of exploration of movement. However, really beautiful improvisational movers are very, very skilled technical dancers, whether that's technically like ballet or just, you know, any other dance form, right? There's some sort of foundation that they have practiced for literally thousands of hours of their lives in order to get in a studio and like just move, right? So it's bananas to me to think that like we'll go to a sales training, we'll learn a skill or a concept in an hour on a Friday. And so then it's off. like, okay, so good luck, on, good luck on your call on Monday morning when you're going to put, put this into play. That that's essentially like taking a championship basketball team, drawing up a new play uh-huh. and then whistle blows for tip off. What? Never in a million years would that happen. They would practice a lot <laughs> before going into this championship game. So it blows my mind that that isn't like the table stakes experience of, of sales organizations where you bring in a new concept and you're going to practice it. So I, that brings me all the way back to like, I'm really excited that uh, we actually have got specifically with this empathy project. It's not just like, hey, let's sit around and talk about it. 
yeah. we're role playing, we're taking calls, snips of calls, and finding like, okay, well, how did that go? What could we have done differently? We talk about it, but then we role play it, we practice, yeah. it, and then we do it again until it starts to become like, oh, right, like I, I could have asked this differently, or what if I tried this? Or like, I've been in the middle of a role play when Nicholas is like, hey, wait, actually try it this way, rewind, do it again, right? Mm-hmm. And it just makes sense. It makes then when you get in the real time game time scenario, you're not stumbling over your words. You're not looking down at your notes being like, oh God, I know I had this somewhere. Like it's just real. It's authentic because you, you've learned it and it's becoming second nature. And that's how you build trust. Cause you don't feel like it's a script. You don't feel like it's uh, something that you're putting on. It's authentic because it is truly then ingrained into you. I think it goes back to like what you said, like my secret, like superpower has been, I came to this being extremely authentic and real in myself. And when we're asked to do a play or we're asked to go present something that's not in our voice, it was written by marketing. I'm trying to understand it. I'm trying to get my head around it. I'm still at that point. And then you want me to be the expert on this next week? to the person that's an educated buyer that knows their industry and knows their market better than I do or my marketing team, most likely. It's an interesting conundrum. And I think you bring a lot of really good understanding in terms of getting that opportunity to coach, like getting that opportunity to practice because an athlete as well, myself, and it's like, yeah, you, you would screw up that move a thousand times over if you played it the first time in a game and you'd look horrible. And that's what we ask our sellers to do every day. And then people go, well, then why didn't that work? All right. So All right. Some, some amazing things there in terms of focusing on the coaching. And I think now more than ever is a time to probably slow down mm-hmm. because there's so much noise in the market, right? Sending six more emails. It's made, there's going to be a lot of people on this podcast that are listening that are going, no, send more emails. You have to do the emails. You have to do the activities. And I agree. There's a, there's a point there. Mm-hmm but showing up better mm-hmm. is going to make a hell of a lot more difference than sending six more emails. Absolutely. I, I will all day, every day, take the um, like title of most efficient seller over the most activities. Like I don't care if you sent 2000 emails this week. I sent 500 and still booked more demos, right? Like I, yeah. or yeah, I, I just, or, you know, I closed X amount of business with this many opportunities versus like how, you know, you can, you can play the numbers game and I, and I get it. Like it's a mix. You have to find the balance of, of quality and quantity and you have, do have to do the activities. Like, I'm not saying you just sit back and be yeah. like, yeah. Um, but there are ways to find how to be, efficient with it. So yeah, I feel that. I like that. That's awesome. And I think the tides are changing. I think um, with kind of the, I call it the old school hub spot or the old school kind of just sales outbound approach of, of cold prospecting. I think that's starting to die or not die, but I think it's when, when the, you know, when you can not just put it in play and it turns on and it works like no longer the inbound are coming in the same way and no longer the emails are getting the same response rate yet we've invested all this money and all this stuff in tech. We have to start looking at doing it differently. Mm-hmm. And I get that we're at a really cool crossroads, both in marketing and in sales. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I always say uh, marketing ruins everything, but I think just in general, you know, arming 500 people with spam cannons is going to create a lot of noise and not a lot of impact. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it, it's an interesting thing. So tell me a little bit about yourself. Take me back in time, um, Ashley, kind of how, you know, you told me a little bit about your transformation into into the sales role at Chili Piper, but where do you live? Um, kind of give me a little background there. And then some introspection. If you look back and say, okay, right out of college, what advice would you give yourself? Mm. Knowing all that you know now. Oh, man. Uh, where to start? Okay. I, I'm in Portland, Oregon. Yeah. Okay. Beautiful here now, finally. Um, 
you mentioned this earlier, I just bought a house. My wife and my dog and I now own a home, which is crazy to think of. Uh, yeah, for, for the folks who follow me on LinkedIn, I posted about this. Like I just where I grew up and what my experience was like, but that was never something that I imagined I could do. Um, and as like sappy as this sounds, like I, I, like I have to credit this with my career in sales. Like I was making good money as the head of marketing at a startup, but you know, my, I very quickly matched those earnings in my first year as an SDR. So like, and then I've just continued to grow from there. Um, and it's been amazing. I, yeah. So, so that's, that's where I'm at right now. Um, I'm going to, you know, I'm excited to continue to, uh, to grow and improve and, and grow those earning potentials as well. Um, if, and so on that note, like <laughs> if I uh, were to tell, like go back to myself right out of college, I probably would have been like, um, okay, like sure. Marketing is the creative side of the house, but like you're going to be so good at sales. Like, just go, just do that right away. You know, <laughs> Skip right to it. I love that. Right over, just get over there. Um, I'm really grateful for my experience in marketing. It's obviously been super helpful selling to marketers and selling to go-to-market teams. I can speak that language. I understand what they mean when they start telling me about UTM parameters and attribution and all this mess that there's, you know, a problem for them. And I'm like, yeah, I hear you. I've been there. I understand the pain. Yeah. Uh, so I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't change it, but I do think, I think I've heard other people talk about this too. Like, man, I wish I had found sales sooner. Um, and I, you know, I have I feel two ways, but I don't have any regrets. And also like, what if, what, that would have been, that would have been cool. So. Yeah. I think I, it goes back to your empathy piece. So I, I love that idea. You know, I've been a marketer, but I've worked in the sales space for a long time. And so I feel like I, I resonate and can really understand sellers because I get to talk to more sellers than I do marketers most of the time. Like I, I, I live in that world. And, and so there is something about the knowing that language and being able to talk to them and, and meet them where they are. That's tremendous. And outside of work, I'm curious, kind of some of the fun things you do, just got a puppy or a dog. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe not be a puppy, but you've got a dog. So I'm thinking a lot of dog walks and that side. But also I read that you do some pretty cool stuff with the Surf Rider Foundation. Yeah. So actually one of the first things I, I surf, I love being outdoors. I snowboard. I, yeah. I'm just super active. Uh -huh. uh, but one of the first things I did when I first moved to Oregon uh, was look for like surf, surf rider volunteer opportunities. And one of the first things that popped up was um, this thing they do in the summers is like teaching middle school kids how to surf. Awesome. And, and I mean, there is nothing in this world that is quite like seeing the face of a child pop up out of the water after they have just nosedived <laughs> on a big long board, like face first into the water. And they come up with just the biggest, brightest, gig like gigantic smile on their face. Like, I have to do this again. You know, like there's just, you can see the stoke. You can yep. feel it. It's amazing. That's awesome. I love, I love Surf Rider. I love what they do. Um, there's also a lot of just like uh, organization around beach cleanups and policy changes. And, you know, uh, Surf Rider is part of who, and I, I worked on this campaign, um, who got Portland to be like, straw free right like if you go to a bar here in portland there's no straw in your drink or if there is it's a paper straw like yeah so stuff like that it's really important to me i'm, a, I'm an ocean baby so yeah that's cool that's awesome and so if you're not in the sales office or if you're not working for chili piper and we can't find you on a call if I'm, and, I, and if i remember right chili piper is all of our scheduling calendaring making sure those meetings happen I sum that up pretty, pretty well. Yeah, that'll work. Okay. If you're not doing that, make sure that you're checking out the Surf Rider Foundation. Where can people connect with you, Ashley, if they want to continue this conversation? Uh, yeah. LinkedIn is probably the easiest 
Ashley Zaks on LinkedIn. Very awesome. Well, impressed. Um, with that, thank you so much for joining me. This has been a really fun episode, really fun conversation. And it just really gets to the heart that what's driving sales today is the relationships, how we make people feel, making sure that they're heard and understood. Ashley, it's been great to have you on. Thanks for having me. This is fun. Yeah. And to all of our listeners, um, catch this episode and more wherever you get your podcasts. Uh, like, smash the comments, uh, share, make sure you're passing these around your organization. If you think that coaching or working on some of these empathy projects like Ashley and team are doing over at Chili Piper are important for your growth, definitely connect with her. And until next time, we'll see you back here on the B2B EQ podcast. Thanks. We hope you enjoyed this episode of B2B EQ. Be sure to rate, subscribe, and follow the podcast for more exciting insights. To learn more about the value of EQ and the technology powering today's conversations, visit us at unifor.com.